Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 669th new social environment. I'm going to let you all file in here. I'm Chloe, Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Veronique Chanon Burke, Michael Finley, and Phyllis Tuckman. We're thrilled to welcome poet Daisy Freed here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for actual necessary decolonial work, but a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustained and enriched the stolen land that we're speaking from. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's guests and host. Throughout her career, Veronique Chanel Burke has taught a range of subjects in art market studies and art history at Queens College, Parsons School of Design, among other institutions. Her museum and research positions have included work at MoMA and the College Art Association. And she's also worked at the Hotel Drouot in Paris. From 2002 to 2021, she was the director of Christie's Education in New York, where she taught the history of the art market and art history, more specifically classes on French art and on women artists. Michael Finley is a director of Aquavela Galleries, which specializes in impressionist, modern, and post-war contemporary art. Finley directed one of the first galleries in Soho and Manhattan in the 1960s, pioneering the work of artists like John Baldessari and Sean Scully. From 1984 to 2000, he was a senior director at Christie's Auction House. Among other board and council positions, he was recently appointed by President Biden to the State Department's Cultural Property Advisory Committee. Finley lectures frequently at museums and universities in the US and abroad, and has published poetry and essays in journals, periodicals, and exhibition catalogs, as well as two books. Critic and art historian Phyllis Tuckman is hosting today and teaches and writes about art, particularly sculpture. She's taught at Williams College, Hunter College, and the School of Visual Arts, and she's an editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail. And with that, it's my pleasure to pass it over to you, Phyllis. Thank you, Chloe. Um, as, as all of you know, I sort of began with a little introduction. So it's shorter than usual because we have two great speakers today. Um, for years, I've wondered how the legendary Leo Castelli would fare in today's art world. I would picture him facing off with Larry Gagosian. But these days I realize Castelli held a card worth far more than land on go and collect $200. Like the latest mega dealers, Castelli was European, someone with savoir faire, as well as plenty of je ne sais quoi. Plus, I now realize I should have been pitting Leo against David Zwerner, Ursula Hauser, and Ian and Philomene Mager, uh, and Manuela Wirth, Monica Spruth, and Philomene Magers. Anyway, when I brought this up during our Zoom run through, Michael had a ready answer, but I'm getting ahead of today's program. This afternoon, we're primarily focusing on four art dealers based in New York during the 50s and 60s who were women. All are currently being celebrated with an exhibition at the David Nolan Gallery. Jill Cornbley, Martha Jackson, Eleanor Ward, and Eleanor Seidenberg. There could have been many others, Grace Borgenick, Terry Dittenfass, Marion Willard, Eleanor Quan Dexter. Incidentally, all three Eleanors spell their name differently. <laughs> Having grown up across the river in Passaic, I started visiting these enchanting art emporias when I was in high school. Then by the time I entered graduate school, I was lucky enough to repeatedly be visiting galleries run by Virginia Dwan, Paula Cooper, and the ever youthful Ileana Sonnebend. We're lucky 
to have a very knowledgeable, sophisticated duo, Michael and Veronique, to talk further about these dynamic women and the art they exhibited. Can we have the first image? So um, basically in the old days, you didn't go to a palace to look at art. Sometimes when I go to David Zwerner, I think I'm, I'm entering Emile Zola's uh, department store from La, La Bonheur des Femmes. Uh, these were just one story, simple places. Seidenberg was located in this building that still houses art galleries on the left. Jill Cornbley was off um, Madison Avenue on East 79th Street. Um, can I have the next? And um, the building where Stable eventually ended up, where, where Eleanor Ward showed um, Warhol and Marisol is no longer there. It's 33 East 74th Street. But I, I, I'm, I'm guessing it looked very much like the brownstone to the right. Can we have the next? And then this is Martha Jackson in front of her old gallery. It was replaced by that boxing promoter um, the guy who had his hair standing up. Um, and now I think it's where Zwerner is. Um, so they were all in the immediate area. So here's Martha Jackson. Jill Cornbley is in the back of that picture. Jill Cornbley used to live on um, Fifth Avenue and 78th Street. So I would see her when I was uh, in graduate school, um, uh, walking between her apartment and the gallery on 79th Street. Can we have the next? Um, here's an amazing photograph of Eleanor Ward and a, a, a picture of Mrs. Seidenberg who ended up with the exclusive rights to showing Picasso in the United States. May we have the next, please? Am I rushing through this too fast? Okay, so when you say Jill Cornbley to me, I immediately think of the Dan Flavin show because it's such a significant part of um, um, his history and chronology. Michael, did you see that Dan Flavin show? Uh, no, I don't remember that show. And it's interesting that my association with Jill Cornbley is um, vividly Malcolm Morley um, and also Peter Phillips, because I was working at that time at the age of 18, 19 and 20 at Richard Feigen Gallery. Feigen and Jill were very close friends. Feigen represented a number of British pop artists like Gerald Lang and Alan Jones. And they were, and, and so basically Cornbley and Feigen's artists were close friends with each other. Malcolm of course was, was, was British, so as was I. So um, the interesting thing about Jill also was that she was a great Anglophile and an admirer of the British royal family, which may or may not have played a part in her, her representation of some, some British artists. But I mean, what, what I think is a striking difference between then and now is the degree of collegiality um, and lack of overt competitiveness between a number of galleries, including Leo's, who were all showing emerging or emerged artists on the Upper East Side. 
and we were all in and out of each other's galleries and shared the same group of collectors pretty much. Michael, how do you think she found those British artists? I mean, they were kind of young at the time. Well, they, 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 were, they were living, some of them came to live in New York. So there was a, uh, for instance, R Richard Smith, had been at the Green, had been a Dick Bellamy uh, artist. He went to Feigen, but he um, he was picked. He was he came to live in New York um, because he wanted to be in the scene, and and others followed him. It was quite common in those days. For instance, Alan Jones took Larry Rivers Studio in the Chelsea uh, Hotel for a couple of years and painted did some of his great early paintings there. So they 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 were around. They they weren't necessarily imported, they were part of the scene. And so when she showed Malcolm Morley, she was showing that ver those very early magazine covers? I, I remember specifically the large painting of an ocean liner with an X across it. Mm. So he, he, he was a kind of a conceptual new realist at that time. <laughs> I, I don't know if you'd call him that, but uh, yeah. Early now, Malcolm. Um, can Go we ahead. have the, the, the next, please? So I've I uh, I I I've I've included this Andy Warhol because this is in the show, um, but the Stable Gallery had one of the greatest Andy Warhol shows of all time, the Brillo Boxes, and. Partly what was so significant about the Brillo boxes, which were initially designed by an abstract expressionist painter, was that they were not exhibited as if they were minimalist sculpture, but they were kind of haphazardly piled up together. Um, Michael, do you do you think it would have been easy for Eleanor Ward to have stumbled on Andy Warhol? You're not on mute. I think a lot of people knew about Andy because he was fairly ubiquitous as a designer. I mean, he was in and out of galleries even as a kind of collector in the, in the late 50s or early 60s. So, um, but I, I don't know at, at what point, uh, I know he approached, he approached Ivan Karp first and he was doing cartoon paintings and Ivan said Roy Lichtenstein's already doing those. And that's when he went to, to do the money. And I don't know, but it, it, it's a, everybody knew each other. So Ivan could have easily said to Marilyn, maybe you wanna look, I mean, uh, to uh, Eleanor, maybe you wanna look at, at Andy Warhol. Uh, uh, to me, one of the fascinating things about the that exhibition and 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 what happened subsequently, I think those those were about two hundred dollars each. They they were not. I mean, even even in those days, that wasn't really expensive. And a lot of people that I knew, collectors, had bought them um, almost as novelty items. Um, uh, and some of them, uh, some of the collectors who treated them as art. Uh, would place them on the floor of their homes. And the ones who treated them as novelty items put them in plexi boxes and uses them at coffee tables. Of course, now the ones that were protected in the plexi boxes are much more valuable than the, the ones that were, rain, were put on the floor and got kicked around by the dogs and the children. Oh my gosh. But you said something that fascinates me. One dealer would call another and say, maybe you should look at this person? Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and artists would do it as well. I mean, Jim Rosenquist, who, who was a Castelli artist, called Dick Feigen and said, you should look at my assistant, who is a, 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 a shaped canvas builder called Charles Hinman. And, and Feigen took Hinman on very successfully at the time. So it, it's difficult for us to understand how small it was, kind of how collegial it was. And there were, I mean, people wanted to sell and make money, but it was not about that. I mean, 
those deal, dealers like, while well, Leo was making some money, I'm not sure if, if Jill was, was, was subsidized. I, I have no idea. Uh, uh, Feigen was subsidized with a back room business of impressionist paintings and, and surrealist works he got from Julian Levy and Joseph Cornell would drop boxes off once in a while. Bob Elkon, the same way, Bob Elkon had, um, you know, Agnes Martin drawings scattered around his office, some of them even unframed. Um, and, and, and the galleries were very small. I mean, there were, there were usually one, I mean, a dealer, I, I mean, I don't know how many helpers Leo had, one or two. I was one of two at Feigen, you know, Jill probably had two. It was, there, were, there was no ladder up the art world. If you got the first step, you were halfway there. And the second step was really where the owners, the owners sat, so. Wow, and I, I, I just wanted to mention for our audience that back then, Fifth Avenue and Madison Avenue were two-way streets. Oh, good point. Yeah, yeah, that was like a whole nother adventure. You would take the bus up and down. Yeah. Oh my God. Can we have the next, which will be an example of, uh, of, of the Abex that um, uh, Martha Jackson showed. And this particular Chamberlain at David Nolan is a real little gem, um, mm. kind of amazing, but uh, Veronique, have you found much about Martha Jackson? Well, it's a it's a good question, and I, I actually enjoyed that conversation so much between you and Michael because you had the chance to experience it as as real things going in, and and as an historian and art historian who is interested in trying to recompose this history, um, I feel like there are indeed some of those women that we know much more about. So Martha Jackson's there's a lot of good information about her. There's been a couple of solid exhibition. Obviously the work that her uh, family did with her, um, you know, her uh, hometown up in Buffalo. We, we have a better sense of, I think, what she's done and how she's, um, you know, kind of made her imprint on the, on, on, the art, on, the, on the artist of that period. But if I may go back very quickly, Phyllis, this idea of the communication between the dealers, I think Michael really said it in a very uh, eloquent way, but we can look even at Leo Castelli. And when you look at, uh, there's an interesting um, art historian, Titia Ols, who actually mapped out. And she mapped out, finds out by looking at the receipt and mining the data in the receipt that Castelli had more interaction with dealers than collectors, actually. That most of his commercial interaction where among other dealer and, you know, Cornbly, she worked with um, Castelli and Carp, obviously, and with Betty Parsons. So I do feel that it's important to reassess this idea that it was a small world where dealers work together. And this is a pattern that we know uh, back from the early 1900s and even the 1800 dealers communicating and, and collaborating with each other, creating networks that is not as competitive as certainly the, the, the art world now or, or competitive in a different way. But this was very important. So I feel like Martha Jackson is probably one of these women that we know the most about. And um, one of the things that might be interesting for us to understand is also how do we trace them and how do we find them? So somebody like Cornbly, for instance, I find stuff about her by looking at um, record about other artists. So having to mine other galleries to find out whom she talked with and finding, for instance, interesting um, oral history between Rosalind Dexter and the Archives of American Art, which speaks about her. But it's very difficult to find uh, more relevant um, information. Someone like Jackson, who gave her, um, you know, her archives to the Archives of American Art, it's much easier for us researcher and you know something that I see developing among young art historian is the capacity to actually go and mine and re reconnect the historical parts, the artist with the dealers, which I think is something that 
we still have a lot of work to do. But yes, Martha Jackson is one that we we have more information about maybe than the others. I don't know um, if Michael agrees, but um, well, I, I one think that has not disappeared totally. As you were saying that, Bernie, what one thing struck me what, was that artists, and I'm, I'm thinking of, if this, is this correct? In those days, artists generally stayed with galleries. If you tried to do that now, in other words, if you followed an artist's career, you'd find them bouncing backwards and forwards. I mean, a very successful artist's career, bouncing backwards and forwards between Pace and Zverna and Gagosian. And you, in those days, the, the loyalty factor, if we can call it that, was uh, really quite high. I mean, certainly mm -hmm. through the 60s, it may have, when uh, Sydney, Sydney Janice started picking off some pop artists later in, you know, later, but, but um, the, nobody thought of quote unquote, stealing an artist from another gallery. I mean, it was, it just, it was unheard of. No, and, and one thing, you know, to, to follow up Philip on your question, what we also see and, you know, I haven't, my research is not extensive enough to see this, but I see this as a trend. If someone like Martha Jackson is the idea of creating a space for the artist. So this idea of creating the community and using the gallery, not so much as a commercial space, but also as a place of, of helping and building the community and nurturing the artist, being kind of like a gatekeeper. And, and, um, and I think one of the things Jackson did very well compared to maybe a lot of the other women artists, is, uh, women art dealer, is to actually show quite a lot of women. Um, you know, you, you talked to, mentioned Mary Saul before, but of course, John Mitchell and, and um, you know, she, 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 that's not, that was the idea of women art dealer doesn't equate with them promoting women artists, which so Jackson is also kind of a rare in, in that group, I think. Uh, we have uh, the next one, which brings us to Eleanor Seidenberg. Um, uh, amazing that she got the exclusive with Picasso. Um, I don't know, is this gonna, is it, is it possible for me to come back on the screen? So this is, this is a, a catalog of a show that Seidenberg did, Picasso, and every decade was at a different gallery. It was for the benefit of the Public Education Association. It was called 1962, Picasso and American Tribute. And I think it's fascinating because these were the galleries, Nodler, Paul Rosenberg, Duveen Brothers, Pearls, Stamfili, Cordier Warren, The New Gallery, Otto Gerson, and Sadenberg. None, none exist today. And this, is, this was just a remarkable show. And there was another um, show that the Public Education Association did seven decades. Again, the concept was um, a different gallery with each decade. And this was 1966. And now these are the galleries, Paul Rosenberg, Nodler, Pearls, Evie Thaw, Stephen, Stephen Hahn, Pierre Matisse, Andre Emmerich, Gallery Odyssea, Cordier and Ekstrom, and Seidenberg. I mean, these were classic places, all gone. And um, they have the, there was a Brock show also, and um, the Brock catalog is in a vitrine at David Nolan's. So I just thought I'd mention it. And Seidenberg showed classic European art. I guess we could go back. Go back, yeah. Can I can I just ma mention in in the photograph of of Eleanor with with Picasso and Kahnweiler on the 
left, you can see her handsome husband, Danny, who, who is a cellist. And in fact, uh, El Eleanor Seidenberg started her life on the stage, which is why her wealthy family cut her off. From the stage, she fell in love with the principal cellist in the in the in the orchestra pit, and Danny um, was certainly welcomed into the art world, but he was not part of the um, part of the business, other than the fact that he would often rehearse or even play in the back room, as every gallery had a back room. So if you went to Seidenberg to see a Picasso show, you might easily hear uh, Danny, uh, who, is, who is an excellent uh, cellist. So um, that's a kind of a, 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 family, a family anecdote that, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to think of what the equivalent would be today, but, but I didn't even go near that. Wow. So now we have some installation shots of, um, of, of the Nolan show. In the first room, when you walk in to the left, um, the, the room that's facing um, 82nd Street, you have a beautiful Joan Mitchell and two gold Louise Nevelsons. Here in the back, uh, uh, Robert and Gianna in the back. Uh, I think that's Richard Stankiewicz over the fireplace. I think this is a Louise Bourgeois on the pedestal, a Dan Flavin in the corner. Oh my God, I'm just remembering his first name is Al. Uh, Alfred Jensen. Jensen. Alfred Jensen. Yeah. Alfred Jensen. And now on the left, that is a very early Jim Dine. I wonder what Jim Dine thinks of these paintings now. Uh, we're facing a Robert Indiana that we're going to see again, the Warhol, Paul Tech, and Billy Al Bankston. And now this is a, a grouping of works on paper um, of the type that um, uh, Seidenberg showed um, in the middle are du buffets. Uh, to the right, the lower one is a Julio Gonzalez and a Picasso. So there's a, an amazing, amazing mix of works in this show. Can we have the next, please? So Michael, did you see these, uh, did, you, did you see Robert and Deanna? Yes, yes, and, and it, it, it it sparked uh, a memory because um, I'm thinking about these uh, women's, the, the, the sense of their personalities. And um, I mean, this is from my vantage point of a very, very young man, a green green in the art world. Jill, Jill Cornbury was, was, was uh, very friendly. She was maternal, she was accommodating. Um, she had a, a, a good sense of humor. Um, Eleanor, the same, uh, uh, always, always ready to talk to, to, to anybody and share her wisdom. Eleanor Ward, I, I felt, uh, was, was far more formidable from a, from a personality point of view. And in fact, Bob Indiana told me, I mean, probably at some point in the 70s, and I, I have no idea how this came up, but he told me that, that in one of his shows at the stable, he had brought in a painting which had a juxtaposition of, of blue and yellow. And, and, and um, 
Ward had told him to get it out of her sight that she couldn't stand looking at it. And, and he, he was kind of, he told me at the time he was alarmed and rather he didn't quite understand it. Um, <laughs> and it's interesting that he did exactly what you told him in those days, I think artists did what their dealers told them. Um, but he, he, she explained to him sometime later that those, those, the juxtaposition of those colors struck some childhood chord of discord and anxiety. And it was as a psychological, um, uh, uh, I don't know, something had happened to her as a child, her mother from her mother, when she was in, you know, looking at something blue and yellow, but, but she certainly was not afraid to, um, you know, tell an artist what, what to do. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know if maybe dealers do that today, but um, in those days, uh, Bob Indiana uh, was, um, I wouldn't say he was afraid of her, but he, uh, she was someone you took very seriously. That is an amazing story. I'm amazed because blue and yellow were my high school colors. Well, of course, they're the colors of Ukraine now. So, <laughs> Veronique, have you ever heard a story like that? No, but that's why I'm I'm, I'm enjoyed, uh, you know, hanging out with Michael and trying to. Uh, and it's actually an interesting thing that you asked that question, Phyllis. Is you know, I I co-founded a, a place called the Women did uh, art dealer digital archive or WADA with my colleague Katharina Tocci. And this has been one of the things we're trying to do is to gather interviews and oral history to try to kind of actually make sure that anecdote, not anecdotes like this, but you know, ev events and, and, uh, and little blurbs like this that are very important in trying to make the artistry, I feel deeper and richer to understand this dialogue between the artist and their dealer. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done on that topic. And um, it's, I mean, when I think about, obviously, Eleanor Ward, not having been able to, to meet her or anything like this, is to understand also that for so many of these women and for Eleanor, I think she closed the gallery in 1970 and that was it. And then there was no more gallery. So this idea that often their um, life, uh, the, the life of the gallery is not that long. It's very often just connected with the woman herself and, and with, you know, Eleanor Stair, she, she wanted to move away from the art world. This idea that there's not uh, the sense of legacy, which goes back to what uh, Michael was saying, which is the, the Im immense personality these women had. And in a way their gallery couldn't survive uh, without them at the helm of it. So of, of course it's a great story. And, but remember also Phyllis, the importance of the stable annuals that um, Ward had as a kind of a repeating event. So the strategy also is really interesting getting people every, every, every year to, 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 to do like a mini biennial basically, which I thought was a, an interesting initiative that she took on. Totally. Well, that, that relates to the next slide, um, which I think is the Jim Dine. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a kind of place where, where, where Jim Dine could think about a happening. No, the idea that, you know, if you were a, a young person or any, anybody being able to walk through the galleries and walk up and down Madison Avenue, or 57th Street on, on Saturday, you would, you'd see now all the people that are in our major museum. Um, it's quite interesting. And many, many of them um, promoted by, by women actually beyond the, the four included in the show. Exactly. Michael, did, did, you, did you see any of these early happenings? No. Yes. You the first. Well, no. I, I was at the 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 experiments in art and technology at the, at the Armory. That, that, that they're not quite not exactly happenings, but the the Billy Kluver, Bob Rauschenberg, Alex Hay um, activities. I think it was nine evenings. That was the first attended event, and unless unless you include the 
first showing of, of Andy's movie Empire, uh, which I, well, I wouldn't say I tended the, the whole showing, but I went in and out of it uh, several times. Um, wow. Uh, but no, I, I but, but th this is a fascinating painting because, um, I mean, even today, it's quite uh, extraordinary. Uh, and um, the, 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 the show that uh, is most vivid in my memory from Stable is the Paul Tech exhibition. And I think you have a- Yeah, we do. We have a Paul Tech. For me, the most vivid one isn't, isn't the Warhol, but Marisol. Ah, yes. Well, Marisol yeah. just, I mean, she was on the cover of Time magazine um, when, when she was in one of Dorothy Miller's 12 Americans. I don't know whether she was in 12 or 14 or 16. Yeah. There, she had um, a sculpture that's now in the Rose Art Museum that was in the lobby of the Whitney. And you could walk between the Whitney when it was on 54th Street and the modern. And yes. then all of a sudden there was this, this Marisol. So I, I, I think that's the most vivid show I remember. Can, can we have the, the next please? And Rosalind Drexler, what happened to her? Well, I, I I don't know, but I mean, she was she was famous and infamous in those days um, because she was also a wrestler, and, mm -hmm. um, and 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 that's kind of the I mean, when when her show opened at Cornbly, I I heard you know I, I heard artists uh, her fellow artists saying you you got to go and see Rosalind's show, quote you know she's a wrestler as if this had something to do with her work. But um, she was quite proud of that fact also. But then I, also, um, Michael, didn't she continue writing scripts and novels and I, things I like think, that? I think she did. I mean, she didn't fade away, but-, but No. I, I mean, the so, something that I, you and I, I think have probably discussed before, Veronique, is that these, these artists who were women at the time, Marisol, Rosalind Drexler, Joan Mitchell, and their relationship with their dealers and other artists and collectors, how can I say this? They, they were not, they were a minority, but they weren't thought of or felt of as a minority. Mm -hmm. In other words, they, there was no tokenism about it. You know, Marisol was, was any lineup that you made in those days of pop art, you'd have to have Marisol and probably Rosalind too, not to include them because they were women, but because they were there. Um, I exactly. think you're right. We discussed this before. It's the idea that maybe the history of pop art has been written, but there's been a, she's been back. I feel like now um, you go to, to, museums and when they have a, a pop-up wall I mean it's maybe a little bit problematic that it's, that it's so late but you see now more of her work and hopefully more of it um, yeah. because and it's, it's a very like interesting take on pop art anyway yeah. mm. oh uh, well I'll come in uh, I think one of the most amazing uh artworks that's in the Jewish Museum show right now of New York City from the early 60s is that Marisol. I don't remember yeah. ever seeing that one before. Well, I never saw it. No, it's, and, and the wall too that has the Dexter, the, 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 the Rosalind and the other pop art wall at the museum also at that exhibition I was thinking about this is quite interesting. It's nice to see our work again. Exactly. Can we have the next, please? So, what do we do with 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 uh, the second generation Abex people? Uh, did did these dealers? Um, how did do do we have any idea how the dealers felt? 
that that did 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 they have a sense that that pop art and minimalism would be replacing these guys? Well, well, some of those guys thought that. Um, uh, but I, I, I think there was a dedication in those days, there was a dedication to the artist, not necessarily an, an idea of getting on a bandwagon. Um, so I think they were, I think people like uh, Martha Jackson were, were, were loyal and Rose Freed, for instance, they were loyal to those artists. They may have found them increasingly harder to sell in the late 60s and 70s, but it's not as if things changed overnight. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. As you remember, Phyllis, a lot of people thought pop art was a joke. I mean, it was being publicized as a joke by, by Life magazine, you know, um, and people like the Skulls were kind of scoffed at for spending, uh, you know, money mm -hmm. on it. So the, there was a much wider collecting audience in, in New York that was supporting the galleries that sold uh, uh, impressionist paintings and the galleries that sold de Kooning, the galleries that sold, you know, like, like um, Marlboro and, and uh, Sidney Janis, who were kind of the, 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 the big, big box galleries of the day. Exactly. Can we have the next, please? You know, I feel that when we look at the the roster of these artists, to 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 answer to your question too, Phyllis, this, this idea that you look at the rosters of the galleries and you realize that even if we don't remember all the names now, when you look at the invite and all the ephemera, you realize that it was much more layered and that the gallery could show actually second generation abex and pop artists together that things were not so much in boxes and i think i tend to agree with michael that it's not about the trend but rather the individuality of the artist and you look sometimes at these shows and they obviously would not make sense for us anymore because so many of the artists are different but they were represented by the same gallery i th i think much more professors at, at universities had access to showing more easily. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Louise Bourgeois is just, I mean, it's hard to believe Louise Bourgeois had a hard time and then boom. Can we have the next please? Michael, so what was it about the Paul Tech show at Stable that 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 caught your attention? Oh, it was horrifying, first of all, because they were they were highly realistic pieces of human flesh or bits of flesh with with hair on them. I mean, and the centerpiece was a was a work which I think was colloquially called Death of a Hippie, which was a full-sized effigy of Paul Tech with long hair lying on his back with his eyes closed with beads around his neck and one hand severed. And the severed hand was two or three inches from the severed wrist, only one hand. And it, it, was, it was strange, it was compelling, it was disgusting, it was, you know, and, and it was in a kind of a, a, maybe I remember this, in a kind of a, a, a pyramid or a tomb. It was, it was in a tomb-like, maybe you looked into it. The work, the work has gone through various different uh, formations. And there was also, he also had a, 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 an effigy of himself made out of fish, which hung in a tree in the back of the stable, outside the back of the stable gallery. So, um, I mean, this was, you know, you could say pop artists doing cartoons was kind of funny, shocking, but this was really um, in your face, you know, and it, and it, it was it, it was at Eleanor Ward's. Uh, and wow. that, that was really, you know, very brave. I, I mean, I don't know if brave is the right word, but um, 
And you here, know, here you have here you have a kind of painting that you might now call "Take That, Damien Hurst," because it's uh, <laughs> it's got horse flies in it, and it's dated 1967. So, um, yeah. Uh, I wonder if I could jump in and uh, yeah. Michael. Uh, your, your evocation of, of the Poltec show reminds me also of the show that we've talked a lot about where you were able to see it, the Gertrude Stein show, at Gertrude Stein show, which was the uh, the shit show, excuse my language, with people <laughs> like uh, Sam Goodman and, and Boris Lurie, which do, when you think back, have a really interesting take on pop and uh, especially Boris Lurie. Uh, and, and, and in, the, in a very interesting and abject way, in a strange way, which is not at all this idea that we have of pop, as you say, cartoony and, and, and the world of uh, boxes and stuff. Yeah. So right. they were very brave women doing very brave things in, in, in galleries. Outrageous in a way, yeah. Wow. Um, and, and, and Eleanor Ward, she was she was the one who first worked for Christian Dior. Veronique, that's yes. that, that's yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. See, I love and that. Actually, the one that I know it's that's how he he is the one that encouraged her to um you know to to actually open a gallery. I love that image with Michael's description of Paul Tech. <laughs> Can we have the next, please? So then I, I put in a little group of, of, of artworks by LA artists that were shown in New York. And I don't remember seeing any of this. I remember last seeing Larry Bell and, and, and Billy L. Bankston. Um, I forget who showed Larry Bell, but it was it was one of the uptown galleries, I think. Um, the only one I remember are it was Jill Cornbley showing little Robert Graham, those little figures in boxes. Oh yes, I remember that show vividly. Now you mention it, little plexi boxes. Exactly. The little people and the beds were made out of toilet paper, perhaps. But I mean, there was. Yeah, miniature, miniature uh, figures. Yeah. And, 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 and can we figure out among ourselves why, I mean, I feel, I, I, I always feel badly because I, I, I didn't go to Pondexter and I feel like I missed significant groups of Richard Diebenkorn's that I would have known early on had I gone to Pondexter was did 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 the LA artists not get reviewed were 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 they just you know oh I think there was a definite sense and I have to say to some extent among New York artists and possibly then to dealers and even to collectors uh, not maybe so much about Diebenkorn, but about people like Larry Bell and Billy L. Bankston and, and Ed Ruscha, that there was kind of art light, you know, that they were, you know, like the Beach Boys, not the Beatles. Um, uh, they were fun and groovy and, you know, they come to New York and everybody would have drinks with them, but, they, but their work wasn't as deep or as profound. I mean, that, that's, you know, I'm, I'm, it's very, that's purely anecdotal, but that's, that's a sense that I picked up perhaps at, at the time, rightly or wrongly. Yeah, it's interesting because, can we have the next one? Because, because the, the David Nolan show has these interesting California artists. And, and the next one is I think Claire Falkenstein. And I, mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't know her name till I was reading an old Art International years ago. Yeah. I remembered her name, but I, if you had asked me what her work was like, I wouldn't have been able to describe it. It's, it's fascinating. 
Um, and we have the next, please, which I think is a, a, a great, is the uh, here, a du buffet. I mean, Seidenberg was keeping us appraised of what was going on in Europe. We have this du buffet, we have another du buffet. And I mean, oh my God, I wish, I mean, how much do we think this cost? A hundred dollars? Yeah, I don't maybe, know. <laughs> maybe 150. <laughs> oh my God, I wish I had grabbed one. <laughs> But there was the amazing opportunities. And how about this really amazing Joan Mitchell from 1960? Yeah, yeah. Beautiful painting. Mm. And uh, I, 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 I thought we, we could close. I don't know whether we wanna close with the Bob Thompson because it seems the exhibition, the museum show he has on right now is extraordinary. Who, 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 which one was his dealer? You know, I, I think it was Martha Jackson. Martha Jackson. Mm -hmm. Wait, I wrote it down. Um, yeah, Martha Jackson. And then, of course, Dick Bellamy just stood behind this work for so long. Yeah, yeah, I, and I think I think that um, I, I mean Dick, Dick's kind of w w wisdom and and authority was very important for that. I, I think there were a number of other artists who weren't so keen on Bob Thompson's work. I mean, or, or it was very much considered to be very much an acquired taste or uh, out on the margins in those days. Um, be, at a time when pop and minimalism and hard edge painting and lyrical abstraction and, and, and all of that was kind of, it, in its heyday or approaching a heyday, that this kind of figurative art was not uh, uh, not at all popular. Kind of amazing. Do we want to look at some other pictures or open it up to Q and A? I'm leaving it up to the two of you. Uh, I think I'm 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 game for some questions. How about you, Veronique? Yep. yep, I think that's good. Questions are good. Thank you so much for that amazing conversation. And it was fun to to see the works as well as you were speaking about them. Um, I do have a few questions. The first is from our friend GE and I encourage anyone in the audience to ask your question in the chat and we'll be sure to get to you as well. Thank you so much, Chloe um, and panel. The question is, uh, if we were to go back and, and take a comprehensive, um, you know, look at the press of the time, especially the print, of course, electronic, would we find a significant chasm between the female run and male run galleries. And was there kind of a significant variation in the way the, so, the way the, the, these shows were covered? Thank you. I don't know. I would say I, I, I didn't, I, I think not. I don't think, I, I don't think there was any uh, sense that a female run gallery or owned gallery was an, on any different plane than, than, than any other. Um, no, I, and I'm all, I'm all, I'm thinking also of meetings back in the day of the Art Dealers Association, which was formed around this time, and uh, the female members were quite were quite vocal at those meetings. So um, that they, they were not certainly. I don't think they were treated by the press as second class or any different, um, nor by collectors for that matter. I I. I uh, no, I, I, I don't think so. That, that, I don't know, Veronique, what do you think, or Phyllis? No, I, I agree. I mean, I don't think I've done enough of, of, of you know, 
keeping tab on everybody, but I feel like there was, you know, there was, everybody was taking the same kind of ad at that moment. So there was not a question if your gallery was more successful than other, it was those tiny little ads. And if you look at these ads in the magazines, there is the women and the men, and there's not no difference. And I feel like the reviews, they were also um, directed to the artists. So that's, 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 yeah. I didn't, I haven't seen really any, any big difference, but it's, I mean, it's a good thing to try to keep track of. But John Cannaday, John Russell, Hilton Kramer, and even when he was a reviewer, Donald Judd would have gone in and out of any yeah. exhibition yeah. to do a review yeah. of it. And they wouldn't have even, it wouldn't have crossed their mind that the owner of the gallery was a woman or not. I, I don't think the big change came until Soho, but then, then, then when I think about Soho, I think about Ileana Sonnebend in 420, and I think about Mary Boone on the ground floor in that closet space, and then yeah. she went across the street. Um, I don't think things started to change until galleries had big independent buildings like Gagosian and Soho. I mean, there's a really interesting article published in 1972 in the LA Time to think back about the, the, the complex relationship between East and West Coast that says, you know, the, there's 12 good galleries that deal with contemporary art and 10 are run by women. And of course, Margot Levin, we know very well, but there's, so the, I feel like the recognition was certainly there, not because they were women, but because they were a force and, a, and their weight actually uh, in terms of numbers was quite phenomenal. If you think about parity in other uh, industry, even at the time, I think, you know, the women had certainly more agency as art dealers than they had in as uh, politicians. Yeah, <laughs> back all, in, all, you know, think all, back all, all or even as, as women entrepreneur and yeah. Thank you so much for those answers. Um, and thank you for thank that you. question, GE. Um, the next question is going to be from my colleague, Eleanor. Thank you, Chloe. And thank you so much, everyone, for this amazing conversation. It's been really such a pleasure. And as a, a person named Eleanor, it has been definitely keeping me on my toes. So that's been fun. Um, my question is, so this show highlights four female gallerists who played an influential role in the course of history of art in the 1960s. Who is missing in the dialogue between the four of them? And who were some of the other key female players at the time beyond Madison Avenue? Good question. Right, Nick, that's a good one for you. I uh, you, you, on my, you on my list? I have a really long list, so I'm not gonna bug people. But I would say we could think about Marilyn Fishbank and you know the uh, the, the great um, eccentric abstraction. Um, who are your other? I, I'm I'm a big fan of uh, Bertha Schaeffer, but that's a little earlier for the period. Um, who else did we miss? Rose Reed, I think. Um, uh, Phyllis, you mentioned a couple that were really important, like Terry Diffenbaum and. Um, Odyssey, Odyssey yeah. Gallery had a female owner, I think. Did Odyssey? Yeah. Am I? Odyssey. And of course, Gertrude Stein, who is one of my favorite one, which um, is quite a, an, an interesting also character and person and, and, and a, a, a quite a, a, a great. Um, and then, you know, I mean, do we want to go back in time? You know, that's an interesting question. Or do we want to? Thing back, but I would say Rhodes Freed for me, uh, Marilyn Fitchbank. Um, there was also who La Boissy. Who, who is yeah, the woman? La Boissy. La Boissy. She, she was, I mean, she was a very strong oh, presence she? in the Art Dealers Association, actually. Uh, she was a, quite a quiet person, but, um, uh, and, and she did more classical. Uh, exhibitions yeah, so she wasn't working with contemporary art but but you know she was to be reckoned with also 
I know I forgot her name. Uh, Segers, maybe Segers? Helen no. Seeger. Helen. Yeah, Helen Seegers. Yeah. And, um, you know, then you have Virginia Zabriskie, LNG, who did some really interesting work around photography. So the list is really long. Phyllis, there was a couple of people that you uh, you mentioned in your introduction that we didn't talk, that's not, that I'm not sure. Oh, in, well, uh, uh, oh uh, Juan Dexter. Um, yeah. Juan Dexter was off Madison Avenue in the, in the 80s. Uh, oh, Terry didn't fast. Yeah. Terry didn't fast was like remarkable. I still have incredible posters. Um, and Grace Borgenick uh, showing Leonard Baskin. Uh, Terry didn't pass had ever good. Philip ever good. And also, uh, didn't she show Romare's Bearden too at one point? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you so much. The long list. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Veronique, the audience wants all of those names in the chat. <laughs> oh. Right now, I'm, 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 is it, it yeah, it's, there, it's probably a bit, well, no, I can, I can do it, I can do it. There was a request for a book of them as well from you at some point. <laughs> um, I'm very flattered, it's, we, I have a book in the, in the make, but unfortunately, I mean, not, fortunately, we're actually focusing more on Italian and um, Spanish and, and uh, Portuguese women art dealers, so stay tuned. <laughs> For more. But I can put it in the chat. I can put some of those names in the chat. Amazing. Thank you so much. You're we, welcome. We have a question now from Andrew Woolbright in the audience. So, Andrew, if you want to go next. Hi, everyone. This is an incredible conversation. Thank you so much. Um, I was just putting in the chat, I love this moment of American art history where being a gallerist was closer to being like a rare book dealer. Um, and it was something that you had to really seek out or travel uptown to see, and there wasn't a lot of money in it. But I'm just wondering about your experience now, knowing what we know about CIA funding and backing and money kind of getting into this world that then turned into the Gagosians and like the big institutions that we think of today, how you saw that mapping out in your trajectory, or did you see moments where like money felt like it was coming into these galleries or more frequently or less, and if that was affecting the aesthetics in any way. Hmm. Good question. That's, I mean, one of the things that may, may account for sometimes the short-lived time these women were able to stay in business is indeed how sustainable they were. But um, I don't know that they actually relied on funding or anything. And I think they kind of, a lot of them, I mean, just speaking with Gertrude Stein, for instance, I know that she was not selling anything, but she, were, she used the backroom system, selling schwitters and, and, and you know, modernist artists to support her gallery. So I don't know, maybe Michael, you have a better sense of that, of that period and that transition. Yeah, there was no big money. I, I mean, look, yeah. some some of some gallery, male or female, some galleries were run because the, the owner was quite wealthy and maybe they lost a bit of money or they made a bit of money year to year. Um, that doesn't make it a hobby, but it means that they had capital. Um, uh, none of these galleries that we've discussed were gallery galleries that accumulated paintings for the secondary market. They were dedicated to selling new work by their artists as they produced it. And in those days, their commission was a third. So if they could keep the lights on and the rent paid, uh, they, they, they were pretty lucky. Um, and I don't think there was, there was no money offered to galleries by any sinister <laughs> uh, forces at all. I, I really don't believe that. I think that the, 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 the wealthier galleries, which were like international ones like Marlborough, um, they'd been built up over the years, over maybe decades, and they had very good funding. They had 
But in those days, a, ga a, a gallery couldn't borrow money from a bank. A bank wouldn't lend a gallery money for, for, the, for the business. And even if the gallery owned tons of paintings, they wouldn't, even if they had the gallery had Picassos, they wouldn't lend money against that. So it was a small business, e even if it was, even if the artists were front page news, it was still a very small business. I, I, I think that, that what we, where we are today is a result of everything in our culture becoming monetized. And that probably happened somewhere between the, the 80s and the 90s. And I, and I think that, you know, it's when uh, uh, art, art became treated as an investment and it's, it's part of a, you know, it's part of a much, much larger picture. I don't think the galleries are, are uh, you know, were, I, I don't think any gallery was subverted uh, by uh, CIA uh, money. Um, I, I do know that 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 the there was a bi there was a bias in the State Department towards abstract painting to be to be sent to embassies around the world at that time, which has often been uh, a source of sinister rumor. But I think the reason was because abstract paintings didn't offend anybody in any other country. It's true, and I even remember. At, at, at some point where where you would you would assume that Sidney Janis was was um, a remarkably uh, healthy gallery, it was the back room and 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 I had a friend who worked there who I think once mentioned they just he Sidney just had to sell one to Kiriko and he was fine for a whole year. Yeah, but yeah. Sidney had also invented, the two pocket sleeveless shirt. And that made him a lot of money. Two pockets. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for that question, Andrew. And thanks for those responses. The last question I am gonna ask on behalf of Fong Bui, our artistic director at The Rail. Um, First, on his behalf, I'm going to ask everyone to please go see the show um, before it's finished at the gallery on October 22nd. Um, and then I will ask his question, um, which is, was there a continuity in terms of the relationships being built to the popular programs at Stable Gallery between, say, Alexander Lolas, John Graham, um, an important artist to Stuart Davis, Gorky, Pollock, de Kooning, among others, who later married Ileana Sonneben's mother, Marianne Shapira Strad, Leo Castelli's mother-in-law, and Eleanor Ward. Um, so he's curious to hear about the relationship and continuity between all of the relationships built in these circles with the gallerists. Wow. Well, <laughs> I, I think- That's a tough question. <laughs> You could also mention the fact that uh, John Graham's mistress, Ultraviolet, became one of Andy Warhol's superstars. So um, I, I think it demonstrates the smallness of the world. <laughs> yeah, know. that's a point. Or 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 did John Graham, when he married, when he 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 lived in the building that Castelli was in? Vaguely, I remember that. I don't know if those relationships had uh, <clears throat> had fuel, if you know what I mean. I, I... yeah, it's a that that's a stumper. It, it yeah, yeah that's a it's difficult one. to answer that without without intimate knowledge. <laughs> um, what what what? But to return to the return to something you mentioned at the beginning, Phyllis which may be to tie things together. Um, Leo Castelli's eye, which was extraordinary, I think the part of his success was due to his ex-wife's acumen, Il Ileana's acumen. And I think she had, or had taught him or practiced together at the time. Uh, she had a business, she had a very, very good business sense. 
In fact, her business sense was so good that a number of artists, Leo's artists, were so happy to have exhibitions with her in Paris that they overlooked the fact that they rarely got paid for the works that she sold. <laughs> or, or some of them have complained in later years that they never knew what became of them. Um, but I would say that, you know, behind every great man, <laughs> Uh, is a great woman. It's not a band. I mean, she was she was pretty amazing. Absolutely. But I think it also talks to what you said, Phyllis, at the beginning, which is this was a small community, and you could actually go and see all the galleries and 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 understand and be there at the opening, and it was manageable. So it's it's indeed those relationships were probably much closer because it was a very small world. Yeah. Oh my God, was it smaller? Well, thank you so much to the three of you for this incredible discussion today and for enlightening us with all of this amazing knowledge about these gallerists and these works of art. Um, I'm really appreciative. Um, and thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. We at the rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with the poetry reading. And today I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Daisy Freed, to the stage. Daisy Freed is the author of four books of poetry: The Year the City Emptied, Women's Poetry, Poems, and Advice, My Brother is Getting Arrested Again, and She Didn't Mean to Do It. She's been awarded Guggenheim, Hodder and Pew Fellowships an occasional poetry critic for the New York Times, Poetry Foundation, and elsewhere. She's a poetry editor for the journal Scoundrel Time and a member of the faculty of Warren Wilson College's MFA program for writers and of the BFA program in creative writing at the University of the Arts. She lives in Philadelphia. And with that, please join me in welcoming Daisy. Thank you, Chloe. Um, it's a real treat to be in this company. Um, it was a fascinating discussion. Um, thank you to the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Rail for bringing me in. I'm just going to read two poems today. Um, first, I'll mention um, that you may have heard that this morning a couple of young climate activists threw tomato soup at a Van Gogh in the National Gallery in London. They didn't actually harm it because it was behind glass. And I think that the mistake that they made is they should have taken um, locally grown fresh tomatoes into one of those immersive Van Gogh spectacles and thrown them around there instead. Um, but uh, um, anyway, one night last year, a friend of mine and I were sitting around amusing ourselves, thinking up um, likely other likely immersive art shows. Um, and that was the start of the poem in um, the current Brooklyn Rail that I have in there. It's called Step Inside Van Gogh. Night for $65 will froth and flow, and shapes between the orbiting clouds intensify their indigo, while doleful chipper Imogen heap cools the moonlight fever of the stars in ambient warble. The sounds the shake between you and me. A foothill village lifted by its glow. The tree's a knife, it's not a flame. That's not Saint-Rémy, it's in your head. Immersive spectacle, take me in. Take from me my disease and sorrow dream. But Bosch immersive might be fun, you, you riffing say. And we begin to joke of pokerings in orifices, of bodies stretched on racks like hospital beds. Never mind, I like the godlike feeling I get peering in on all that suffering contained in smallish frames in smallish galleries, a scale to reiterate proportion and intensity. Never mind, I love looking like deities at what humans do, eschewing intervention. Imagine what spectacle could with Kahlo cause per ad copy. copy to come to life. This is really true. Ice pick they got Trotsky with, impalement by trolley bar, the limping legs, that brow, or a version augmented of what I saw in the water. Enter the scenario between her thighs as if she's giving birth to you, lacquered toes propped on tub slab, stale water 
into which she farts scenes of autobio, skyscraper, the empire state, burning inside a volcano, conch shell full of bullet holes, woman strangled with a rope, blood that drips from bathtub plug and curling, caresses hallux, joins the water. No, put her away, her disorder, possibility, and pain. Give, give me Goya's black work instead to walk in, that I may drown with dog in quicksand while an old man starves with soup, while crones circled for a sacrifice quail before the goat god and Saturn eats my head. Else battles, redemption, no such thing, else rebellion in the streets. A man hangs from a tree, dead sticks, life cast it off, a rifle blooms with death, only $65 to sever from me remembrance of kisses and embraces. Let me live far from fading shadow of my dead, stupidity dull and bright, a long way from my omber dread. And this is the second of two poems I'm going to read. Um, this is called Book 13. It's a sort of an interpretation of or a riff on Book 13 of the Odyssey. It's in memory of my husband, Jim Quinn. Book 13. When Odysseus finally gets home, he doesn't know it is his home. Why does Athena love him so much? She, disguised as a boy, Boys are always wandering around, swineherd boy, oysterman boy, pottering along the seashore, a shimmer in the folds of her slash his crappy old clothes. That's Athena's tell, even when shape-shifted to menial youth. Athena's like, come on, man, it's Ithaca, you know. And Odysseus dissembles, says, oh yeah, heard of that place. In this, he reminds me of you, always in the know, when not in the know. Oh yeah, he says, and tells a story of a length we can no longer in this century tolerate, besides which we've heard it all a few times before, how he killed some guy who wouldn't know what he was, who wouldn't do what he was supposed to do, then acquired the loot he's now got piled on the sand alongside what was his sleepy, stretching, maybe fake groggy, now waking self. Bracelets, ear bobs, fanciful weaponry, heaps and heaps of drachme. Drachma from the verb to grasp, its value that of a handful of arrows. And where should he stow it, he says, to the swineherd, oyster fella, young worker, not to lose it all again. And Athena's, come off it, man of tactics, her gray eyes gleaming. She really likes him. Not just in a physical way, though he puts in her a forceful sense of his masculinity, cock, balls, strong arms and back, ropey with muscle, mixed in with the notion he might be a good lover. He's a man with the brain and will use it, rare. She smiles, fast flammable contortion of the mouth, strokes his hand, morphs into a woman tall, beautiful and skilled at weaving lovely things. And he anoints his body with oils that trickle through the curled hairs on his chest, through other hairs on other parts. He smooths his mustache. That's his tell. Why does Athena love him so much? Why does she stick by him and help him out of dangers, even as his expendable crew is devoured, broken, broken, devoured again? My sweet tactician. And why does she raise the fog that shrouds the shore so that he is happy, so his breath comes faster, so there is a corona of light inside him? He is on the brink of completing his story, though still has many trials to endure. Ten books worth, she hopes, at least ten books more. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Daisy. That was amazing. I mean, thank you, thank you. Um, and thank you again to Veronique, to Michael, and to Phyllis. And we'd also like to thank Valentina and Julia from David Nolan Gallery for helping make today's event possible. We'd, of course, also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program and making daily conversations like this one possible and for their support of our growing archive. You'll be able to view today's event later this weekend, and our full archive is available on the Rails YouTube channel. 
For the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events, like here on our daily NSE. You can check the chat for a link to donate to support the writers, editors, and operations here at the Rail. And if you're free on Monday at 1 p.m., please do join us for a conversation with Will Ryman and Eleanor Hartney on the occasion of Ryman's exhibition at Chart, New York, New York. We conclude with a poetry reading by Ariel Reznikoff. And in, as Israel tradition, you can now turn on your microphone and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you, Thank Chloe. You. It was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And go see the exhibition. Thank you. <laughs> I always enjoy it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, Paul. Have Thank an incredible you. weekend, everyone. Okay. You too, Chloe. You. <laughs> Take care, yeah. everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, Veronique. Thanks, guys. Bye, bye Thanks, guys. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Phyllis, Veronique, and Michael. Thank you, bye, guys. Bye. Thank you, guys. You're having a good time? <laughs> you, I'm in London working yeah. at Three Masters. So I'm, Enjoying? Uh, very much so, yes. Good. How's the but, weather? The weather is, is okay, but I so enjoyed your conversation. Thank you so much, all of you, and Chloe and Fong, of course, everybody else. But the three of you were amazing. Great. And you Thank really you for putting a great show on. That was the great important. Show, Martina. <laughs> great show. Bye Thank bye. you. Thank you so bye. much. Bye. Thank you so much, bye everyone. Bye. Thank you, Valentina, and have lovely Thank weekends. You. Happy Friday. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.